The gospel reading today is from Mark 6, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13, and that's on page 40 of the New Testament. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all of this? What is this wisdom that has been given to this man? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and, jo and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And there are not sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the village teaching. He called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for the journey except staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, and to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust and shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed all that, all that should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed them with many who were sick and cured them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Liz, for reading today. Thank you very much. In Robert Burns' famous poem, poem titled, to a mouse. One of the stanzas in that poem created a well-known and oft-used aphorism. One might even call it, if you think about it, an early meme that's still used today. This is what the stanza reads in Robert Burns' own language, in his own way he uses language. But mousy, thou art no thy lane. Improving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes, O oh mice and men, gang aft a glee and lee us not, but grief and pain for promised joy. Now I'll give you the translation of what Burns wrote. But mouse friend, you are not alone. On proving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes of mice and men go oft awry and leave us only grief and pain for promised joy. In this post-COVID world, which we now inhabit, albeit it is barely post-COVID, how can we argue against Burns' common sense? Think of all the best laid plans and expectations that were part of our ordinary lives before COVID, along with the plans of governments and communities and other nations. Now, we live in a time that one sociologist has labeled the post-COVID revolution. A revolution played out in many fields and in many ways. I witnessed an example of this last week, and it kind of hit me when it happened, when I visited a member of our church in the hospital. Having been taken from her room for a minor procedure, actually a test, she waited in a holding area almost five hours afterwards. An attending nurse explained 
that there was no one available to push her gurney from upstairs to her room several floors below because so many health care workers had quit. Have you noticed in other areas of the economy, such as retail or restaurants, that ordinary things which we took for granted a couple of years ago now can take an extraordinary amount of time or they may simply not happen at all. Think about this post-COVID revolution in the fields of politics, travel, education, sports, the church. I could go on and on. We know that. But the bottom line is that everything has changed in the year 2021. And many plans that we had before COVID, not all, but many, are either now impractical or causing us to rethink our expectations, our expectations of life, our expectations of the world. Our culture is now in a time of Plan B. You ever heard that expression before? Plan B. Because, as Burns said, when it comes to Plan A, the best laid plans of mice and men go oft awry. Since we are made in the image of God, would it be surprising to imagine that God also had a Plan B? in the sending of the Messiah, and that the Messiah himself had a plan B in his mission of sharing the good news of the kingdom of God to the world. Why would that be surprising? Since God did not create us to be robots, but created us to be in a free relationship with God and with each other. And relationships never go as planned, do they? He said to me, mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, thus says the Lord God. Whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. They shall know. These words from Ezekiel summarize the purpose for God's prophetic proclamations through the voice of ordinary people who are given, in, as being prophets, extraordinary gifts and an extraordinary purpose. In explaining why God has called Ezekiel, God acknowledges Israel's freedom, just like ours, to say yes or no to their creator's will for their lives and for the world. To say no to God's purpose. God also acknowledges that Israel may reject the prophets just as they have rejected God. But Israel will not be able to deny that their God exists because the people will have to to deal with God's powerful prophets and their words. The prophets do not shut up. And what were these words? As we read of the prophets in the Old Testament, what were these words 
What were these words that the prophets promised Israel and the world? They promised that God would send a Messiah, a plan B in relation to God's original intent in giving God's people the law. Clearly, as God says to Ezekiel, that didn't work out as planned. But the prophets declare that the Messiah would be a living law, one in whose life would be the essence of God's true nature and whose life would demonstrate the meaning for which God created us. Christ came, just as promised, as the Messiah. And though many expected when they encountered him to encounter either a faith healer or if they were going to go a little bit beyond that, a prophet of God, in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the people found something so much more than the prophets and totally unexpected. Jesus did works of power such as never, such as never had been seen in the world. Works that were acts of compassion and love for humanity. Works that were clearly demonstrations of obedience to God's will. Jesus spoke about God as no one had ever spoken about God, calling God our Father and calling us God's children. That language simply did not exist about God in first century. In the initial months of his ministry, Jesus worked at self-revelation, we see this in Mark, by using miracles to reinforce his teaching and to affirm his identity as the Messiah. But Mark's gospel shows us that that plan goes awry. When Jesus travels to his hometown to declare the good news of the salvation of of God. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. They said, where did this man get all this? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there. In Jesus' words, we hear another aphorism far older than Robert Burns, but just as true. A prophet is not without honor, except in his own hometown, his extended family, and even among his immediate family, in his own house. Yet, think about this. Jesus could not allow those most familiar with him to be blocked from the truth of God's love for them and their opportunity for repentance and salvation. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus, early on, Jesus encounters two dilemmas. This is at the beginning of his ministry, and they both involve his self-revelation. First, many only see Jesus as a faith healer, and that's why they approach him. They receive his works, they receive the blessing of his healing gifts, but they do not hear his words, nor do they connect his works to his teaching as the Messiah. Second, those who know Jesus best, those who have known him all their lives, 
struggle to accept his identity as the Messiah of God. In Mark 6, immediately following Jesus' rejection in his hometown, Mark then shows us Jesus' plan B, a plan that remained through the rest of Jesus' ministry and death and resurrection, and still remains Jesus' plan today. What is it? He called the twelve and began to send them out. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. To put it succinctly, Jesus' plan B was you and me. Jesus' plan B was to declare the good news of the kingdom of God through those who believed in him. Disciples, starting at that time when he sent the apostles out two by two, the disciples would be empowered by the Holy Spirit to show forth the love and the compassion of God through acts of healing and wholeness while declaring the good news of God's salvation through the sharing of our faith and our worship together. To actualize the task of his followers, Jesus gave us his table. At Jesus' table, we receive grace for our failures. At this table, we acknowledge that we alter or divert from God's plan through our sin. We do it all the time. But the table is there to restore us to restore us to the place where God needs us to be as a part of God's plan. There was a popular country song a while back by Carrie Underwood, who comes, by the way, from a little town about 30 miles from where I grew up. And the song, you may remember it, put into music another kind of aphorism that became popular for a while in our culture. Some people still say it. Jesus, take the wheel. Jesus, take the wheel. That is what happens at the Lord's Supper. As we surrender ourselves to God's plan for our lives. And we put that plan, the Holy Spirit puts that plan into the driver's seat. And off we go. Christians really ourselves, we do not need a plan B. For in his death and in his resurrection and in his call, the Son of God gave us the only plan that matters. And here it is. He spelled it out in very clear words. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Whatever other plans we make for our lives, as followers of Christ, we must acknowledge that those plans come second to God's plan for our lives. And at this table, we commit ourselves to that plan. It is, a, it is not our plan, it's God's plan. Therefore, it covers us from A to Z in the fulfillment of God's will. So, before you take this table, 
And before you leave here, this worship today, ask yourself a question. What is God's plan for your life this morning? In Anne Lamott's book titled, coincidentally, Plan B, Further Thoughts on Faith, she tells a story that encapsulates Jesus' plan in giving us the sacrament of communion. This is what she writes. There's a lovely Hasidic story of a rabbi who always told his people that if they studied the Torah, it would put scripture on their hearts. One of his students asked, why on our hearts and not in them? The rabbi answered, only God can put scripture inside, but reading sacred text can put it on your heart. And then when your hearts break, the holy words will fall inside. Christ has given us this moment, this time, and this table that our hearts might break so that his love will spill into us. A love so overflowing, so powerful, so moving that we have no choice but to go out into our lives and share it. Not perfectly. That's why we got to keep coming back. But it keeps us going in the direction God wishes us to be. We share that love. We share a story, a witness, so profound and wonderful. We have no choice but to declare it. Here's what it comes down to. Life changes plans. We know that, right? Life changes plans, but God changes us. And that is why we are here at God's table this morning. So let's come and join our hearts to God's wonderful plan given to us in Christ. Our communion hymn this morning 